So, Assalamu alaikum everyone, and welcome to Think Like a Physician Academy. I'm Dr. Mustafa Husni. Uh, in today's session, we're going to discuss one of the um, fundamental topics in PLAC2, one of the very common uh, stations that you're going to face for sure in your PLAC2 tests. It's the CIMAN. So, for the CIMAN, uh, we're going to discuss first the uh, concept of the critically ill because uh, the, the CIMAN as a station actually is put in the PLAB2 exam because they need to test the candidates um, in how, to, how they deal with the critically ill patient. So we'll start first by identifying who is the critically ill patient. And then we're going to know uh, the approach we need to use with the CIMAN stations, which is the ABCD approach. Okay. So uh, in many textbooks, you can find many definitions for the critically ill patient, but to cut it short and make it simple, uh, I would say the critically ill patient is the patient who has a problem, at least one problem in either his airway or and or the breathing and all the circulatory system, including the heart and all the blood vessels. And the patient who has a problem in his consciousness or the patient who has a problem in body temperature, either high temperature or low temperature, or a problem in blood glucose level, either hyperglycemia or hypoglycemia, or the patient who come after sustaining a trauma or any other life-threatening problem or condition. So the critically ill patient is the patient who has any problem or any combination of problems within these categories. And actually these categories are ordered in a way that the most life-threatening conditions are brought first so that you examine them first. For example, if a patient has a problem in his airway and his body temperature is high, he will die from the airway blockage first before dying of the high or low temperature. If the patient, have, uh, the patient has something wrong with his breathing and his blood glucose level is high, he will die sooner of the breathing problem. So that's why in the critically ill patient, the best approach uh, to follow in examining this patient is the ABCD approach. The ABCD approach is actually an acronym for the most life-threatening conditions uh, ordered uh, to be the, the most life-threatening condition on top and then the others uh, will follow. So it, it stands for airway, breathing, circulation, disability and exposure. However, in this approach, you have to do something first before starting the ABCDE and you have to do something after it. So it's not just the A, B, C, D, E. You have to do some steps before and some steps after, okay? So let's start from the underlying principles of this approach. Why do we follow this approach and why? So the aim of A, B, C, D approach is very clear and straightforward. It's very simple. We need to keep the patient alive. First thing, first aim is to keep the patient alive. Second aim is to achieve some clinical improvement if possible. Third aim is to buy some time for further treatments and making a diagnosis. So you can see that the most important thing when you uh, set the uh, critically ill patient is to keep him alive, okay? The second most important target is to achieve some clinical improvements as much as you can. Third aim is to buy some time to allow for further treatments and reaching a final diagnosis. This will include other team members or other teams also. So one of the most important things when you follow the ABCD approach that you 
should do a complete initial assessment at least once and reassess regularly whenever needed. So you have at least to make all these steps once, at least once, okay? You have to treat the life-threatening problems before moving to the next part of assessment. If you have a life-threatening condition in B, never go to C before treating it. And this is quite different from dealing with other uh, patients who are stable because you need to gather all the information first, then you start your management at the end. In the ABCD approach, once you captured a life-threatening problem, treat it instantly before moving to the next part of your assessment. And after you provide the treatment, we assess the effects of your treatment. And at any point, whenever you need help, call for it. You are not alone in this. So for the purpose of the exam, it's important here to involve your seniors and involve other team members. So overall, you will start by assessment. You will assess the airway, the breathing, the circulation, and so on. After assessing these points, you will interpret the findings. And after doing the interpretation, you start your treatment. And after starting your treatment, you assess the effect of the treatment. And then you will get some findings. So you have to interpret them, then treat again if you need it, and so on. So it's a complete cycle until the patient is stabilized or further help has arrived. Okay, clear? Never stop. Assess, interpret, treat. Assess, interpret, treat, and so on. So next point, the first steps that you should do before starting the ABCD approach. When you uh, go to a patient who is critically ill or when you enter the station in Plapto, the Simman station in Plapto. First, you introduce yourself, mention your name and your identification number. In the exam, mention your name and GMC registration number. Then, second point, confirm the patient's identity. You can confirm the patient identity by asking the patient uh, directly, if he's awake and conscious, or you can check the patient bracelet or the patient file if there is any file behind uh, next to the patient. Okay, so to do yourself, then confirm the patient identity to know who uh, you are treating. Then ensure personal safety. This might be relevant in, in uh, real life situations, but for the um, the purpose of the PLAP2 exam, you just need to mention it, just verbalize it. Then you should wear an apron and your gloves as appropriate. And for the PLAP2, you just need to verbalize that. If the patient is awake and conscious, stop by asking, how are you doing? How are you feeling? And so on. If the patient appears unconscious or has collapsed, shake the patient, ask, are you all right? And raise your voice. Most probably in the PLAP2 exam, you will find the patient awake and conscious, and he will respond to this question, how are you doing or how are you feeling by saying something like, I cannot breathe, doctor. I'm feeling unwell. I'm feeling dizzy, and so on. The sixth point is to look toward your monitor or attach your monitor if it's not attached or check the vital signs as early as you can. For the purpose of the exam, most probably you will find a monitor attached to the mannequin. So first thing to do is to check the vital signs of the patients. The vital signs are the heart rate, respiratory rate, blood pressure, oxygen saturation, temperature. Okay, so these are the first steps that you need to do before starting the actual ABCD approach. You do it yourself, confirm patient identity, uh, verbalize that mm -hmm. you will ensure personal uh, safety for you and for the patients. I, I will ideally wear an upper and gloves and start asking the patients, how are you feeling? And 
If he responds, we act accordingly. And then look to the monitor and verbalize the vital sign that you see and the, and the interpretations or the meaning of these vital signs. Like I can appreciate that the patient is tachycardic, is tachypnic, is hypoxic, is hypotensive and so on. Now you can start the actual EBCD approach. Starting from A, the airway, the most life-threatening problem. Because untreated airway obstruction will cause severe hypoxia that will cause damage to many organs, starting from the brain, who cannot sustain hypoxia for long. So the brain will die, will, will be affected by hypoxia. So brain death might occur. Then kidneys and heart, cardiac arrest might happen and complete death might happen. So we will start by checking the airway first. How will we do that? We look for the signs of airway obstruction. Then we will treat the airway obstruction as a medical emergency. Then we give oxygen at the highest possible concentration. So these are the three, three steps for airway management in the ABCD approach. Look for the signs of airway obstruction, treat it, give oxygen at the highest possible concentration. So let's start from that first step. Look for the signs of airway obstruction. This can be complete obstruction. And in this case, you will find no sounds of breathing, no uh, sounds at all. And the patient will not be able to talk at all. Incomplete airway obstruction, on the other hand, will generate noisy sounds. And the patient might be struggling to talk or not able to talk at all. So, by the way, if the patient is able to talk, you can just say, I can't appreciate that the patient is talking, so there is no airway obstruction, and move to B directly. And this is the case in most semantic stations, that the airway is open. But just for your knowledge, what if the airway is closed? Treat airway obstruction as a medical emergency. Treat it rapidly. Open the airway using the simplest possible maneuvers. Do suction if you notice any fluids obstructing the airway. Assist opening the airway using oropharyngeal or nasopharyngeal airways. And you need to understand the techniques of putting them in real life. But for the purpose of the black to exam, most probably the semen is not ready for these maneuvers. So the manufacturer they didn't like um, make it in a way that allow you to insert an oropharyngeal or nasopharyngeal airways. So will not most probably will not use these maneuvers in the exam, but you have just to verify it in case you need it. So you can just say, I will uh, make the head tilt chin lift, the simple maneuver, uh, after confirming that there is no cervical form. I might do air suction in case I find any fluids. I might maintain the airway open by inserting an oropharyngeal or nasopharyngeal airway. And in case all of this fail, trochlear intubation might be required, and this will need extra help from the anesthesia team and so on. Most probably, in the semen in the PLAP2 exam, the airway will not be your problem. So for the stations, if the patient is talking, this means the airway is patent. You have to reply this sentence. In the critically ill patients, sometimes the depressed contrast level might lead to airway obstruction due to maximum relaxation of pharyngeal and laryngeal muscles. So if the patient is unconscious, you should say that ideally I need to maintain the airway open using simple maneuver like head tilt chin lift. I maintain it open by inserting oropharyngeal or nosopharyngeal airways. No need to do the actual maneuvers. Most probably you not need to do them. Okay, clear? Third step, give oxygen at the highest possible concentration. So in any way, you will end this part of your assessment by giving oxygen. 
So you will start by asking the patient, do you have a smoker's cough? This is to exclude COPD. According to the answer, you will, uh, you will act accordingly. Most probably the patient in the exam will say no. So if the patient says, no, I don't have a smoker's cough doctor. So you will use the non-rebreather oxygen mask, which is this one, okay? And you will uh, ask for an oxygen flow 15 liters per minute, which is 100% oxygen concentration. And the target oxygen saturation in the patient will be 94 to 98%. So this is the oxygen flow coming out from the, the tubes and pipes, but this is the oxygen saturation in the patient blood. That is the number that appear in front of you in the monitor. So if it's 90, for example, I have to make it 94 up to 98, okay? On the other hand, if the patient says, yes, doctor, I have smoker's cough, I have COPD. In that way, the oxygen mask that you should use is Venturi mask, and you will mostly start using uh, the 24 to 28% oxygen uh, concentration, and we'll start by four liter per minute. Imagine this is 15 liter, this is four liter, and you will aim to a uh, target oxygen saturation of 88 to 92%. And this is the Venturi mask using the different measures. Each one of these um, tools has a different uh, oxygen concentration that it allows. So for the purpose of the exam, most probably the patient will say, no, I don't have a smoker cough, but it's important that you ask this question to reply that you know that this is an important step before choosing between uh, either uh, the type, two types of mask and the concentration and the set, uh, concentration you will provide and the saturation that you will aim to. Okay, in that way, you have reached the end of the first step, which is A, airway. Uh, you maintain the airway open and you ended it by giving oxygen at the highest possible concentration. Clear? Okay, now, if you are finished, you're done with A, move to B. Never move to B unless you uh, have completed everything in A. Now, after finishing A, go and say that the uninspired oxygen saturation of the patient is one to three, and the uh, reading of the pulse oximeter is one to three. So the uninspired oxygen saturation, that's the, that is the oxygen saturation you have given to the patient, and that pulse oximeter reading is the saturation in the patient blood. So these are the last steps here, okay? So that is how you, like, you make the transition. These are the last steps here. So this will be the first steps here. I have to re report them. You say that I have given my patient 100% concentration of oxygen and his saturation is now something like 90% and so on. Count the respiratory rate. Very polite that I will look uh, to see the respiratory rate. Normally it has to be something between 12 and uh, 20 beats per minute. If it's above this, this is tachypnea. Below this, this is bradypnea. Okay, count them and document them. Then check the position of the trachea in the suprasternal notch. It has to be central. It can be deviated in some uh, conditions like pneumothorax or any condition that will make mid mediastinal shift. For the purpose of the examination, most probably the trachea will be central. Okay due to the limitation of the uh, mannequin. But you have to verbalize it, like to say that I will check uh, the position of the trachea uh, to see it in the supersynodge to see whether it's central or not. Then just next to the trachea, look for the raised jugular venous pulse or jugular venous pressure. Most probably uh, you will have like no finding here due to the limitation of the Medican, but at least you can verbalize it in case the examiner can give you a finding or so. So start from where you ended in the airway and spy oxygen saturation concentration and the oxygen saturation in the pulse oximeter, respiratory rate, tracheal position, jugular venous pulse pressure.
Then inspect the chest. Note any chest deformity. Assess breathing depth and rhythm or better. Okay, you have to apply these steps. Then palpate the chest and assess the chest expansion by uh, using your both hands around the lower part of the chest. And then ask the patient to take deep breath or if the patient is unconscious or not able to do it, just set the, the normal uh, respiration expansion. And verbal that, I, I will feel the chest wall to detect any surgical emphysema. Okay, or tributus can be an indication of uh, pneumothorax. Okay, you will not find any finding like this in the American, but you need to verbalize it. Then say that I will stop percussion, look for dull note, resonant note, hyper resonant note. Dullness will indicate presence of fluids, resonant be normal, hyper resonance will be an indication of uh, more air in the chest like in pneumothorax. Okay, most probably you will find nothing here in the mannequin, but the examiner might give you a finding. Then next step will be auscultation. Uh, normally it's uh, normal vesicular uh, respiratory sounds or breathing sounds, or you might find some wheezes, or you might find some crepitation or crackles. This, uh, most probably you will find these uh, sounds on the mannequin. Okay, so you need to know how to differentiate between uh, uh, these three va variations of breathing sounds. Okay, so for breathing, Oxygenation, oxygen concentration, oxygenation, respiratory rates, tracheal position, raised jugular venous pulse or pressure. Then inspect the chest for deformity, depth uh, pattern, then palpation for chest expansion and any surgical emphysema or crevitus. Then do percussion to detect dullness or resonance or upper resonance. Then auscultate the chest and check for normal vesicular sounds or, or wheezes or crepitation. Okay. Let's make a game. I will unmute all of you. Watch the sound, guys. Okay, I will unmute you now because we will like make a kind of quiz in, in a second. Okay, so after you finish the assessment of breathing and you could make the interpretation, treat the breathing problems accordingly, most probably, uh, uh, so the specific treatment will vary depending upon the case. Most probably we find either uh, wheezes or crepitation, wheezes in bronchial asthma and crepitation in uh, pulmonary edema in case of hardship. Okay, in case of like wheezes, for example, you might need to add the uh, other mask of nebulizer mask. So are you ready for the game? Listen to this sound, guys. So after doing the auscultation of the chest, what is your interpretation of that finding you got? What is that sound? Normal vesicular. Okay, perfect. Who said it? Mama! Vesicular breathing Mama! sound. Hmm? Watch the sound, guys. Watch the sounds. Okay, next. Wheezing? Wheezing. Wheezing, okay. Perfect. Okay, what is it? Repetition. Hmm? No, wheezes again. What are wheezes? 
Okay. Could you could you all hear it? Mm. Could you please repeat again the last one? Okay, clear? Okay. And now you're all muted, but you can send your answers in the chat. Okay, next one. What is that? No, no, I'm run. No, Strider, Strider, yeah, yeah, yeah. Bravo, Habiba, bravo, Mihad, bravo, Shaz, yeah. Rumkai, Shaz, no, this is Strider. Strider. Let's try it. Yeah. So what, what does Strider indicate? If you got this finding, what is your interpretation? You can reply to the chat. Yep, airway obstruction. Yep, upper airway obstruction. Airway obstruction. Okay. By more analysis, you can reach the cause of obstruction, but like more straightforward, stridor means airway obstruction, upper airway obstruction. And for the uh, weeds, what, what does it mean? Yes. Lower airway obstruction. Okay. So both are the same, but it just like it, it, the interpretation would be either upper or lower. Okay. Uh, the the wheezes in asthma starts as expiratory wheezes or inspiratory wheezes. Expiratory, expiratory. Then with more progression, they will be uh, expiratory and inspiratory. This means it has been exacerbated. Okay. Last one. Crepitations, crepitations, crackles. Okay. In in the UK, they, they prefer the word crepitation. In the US, they prefer the word crackling. But both are right. Okay. Would you like me to repeat them? No, don't don't say infection. I'm wrong. Don't say infection. Th these are crepitation and crackling. They can be whatever. Okay, they can be pulmonary edema, they can be pneumonia, whatever. But just say that these are crepitating. Right. Both things in order. So start from, by the way, in, uh, in, in the exam, expect that you will find uh, something like this uh, from the mannequin, from the same man. Because he is not a normal uh, human, he's just uh, a mannequin, and the sound will be somehow digital, and uh, they are like delivered through some speakers under the covering of the, uh, the mannequin. So most probably we'll have to occultate the, uh, uh, the four sides like in uh, upper right and upper left, lower right, right and lower left to uh, put your stethoscope over the speakers inside the same man. This is not like, same like human, okay? Okay, clear. This is normal vesicular breathing sound.
Okay, clear? Most probably in the exam, if the patient is asthmatic, you will hear the sound of wheezes. And if the patient uh, having, is having heart failure, like in one of the uh, stations is a EF with heart failure, you will hear the sound of crepitation. Okay, and if it's pneumonia, however, there is no semen case up till now, like showing the pneumonia. So most probably wheezes means asthma and crepitations means heart failure for the purpose of the exam. Otherwise you will find normal vesicular breathing sound. Okay, and up till now there is no stridor because in stridor, yep, yeah, as you said, like some, sometimes they are audible without even a stethoscope. So most probably you will not find a stridor in the exam because in that way you will need to manage the airway which is not like possible due to the limitation of the semen. So expect one of those two, wheezes or crepitation. Yeah, okay. Next step, circulation. So in circulation, some initial steps, almost always consider hypovolemia to be the primary cause of shock until proven otherwise. In most stations, uh, they will bring a, a type of shock so that you can identify it in the circulation, the C-step, okay? What are the different types of shock, by the way? You can send the answers in the chat. Different types of shock, hypovolemic, septic, anaphylactic, Cardiogenic, okay. hemorrhagic. Yeah. And the polemic and hemorrhagic, yes, okay. So, hemorrhagic, okay. So that's, you're, you're all right. So they will most probably bring a kind of shock in one of the stations, they bring the septic shock like when a patient uh, had some UTI and then he deteriorated. The patient got some pneumonia and then he deteriorated. Any kind of infection, then the patient deteriorated. The anaphylactic shock, well, when the patient uh, gets something that he is allergic to, like uh, they bring it in a form of blood transfusion, anaphylaxis from blood transfusion, or it might be any kind of anaphylaxis. Some other types uh, can, some other times they bring the hemorrhagic shock. Usually in a patient after, after surgery, okay? A famous station is after doing hysterectomy, okay? So this is like a, an indication of uh, hemorrhagic shock. Um, cardiogenic shock is when the patient has heart failure, okay? And this is quite complex for the purpose of the exam. Okay, so anyway, it will be shock and the treatment will be almost the same except for the uh, cardiogenic. So consider hypovolemia, consider the patient hypovolemic if you see the patient in shock. How can you like say the patient in shock? Uh, hypo, hypotension and tachycardia, that's enough. Okay. And then there are an obvious, uh, some obvious signs of cardiac cause of the problem, you will give intravenous fluid to the patient with showing cold peripheries and fast heart rates because these are signs of shock. Unless you're suspecting that the patient might be in heart failure because this fluid will be an extra overload uh, to the heart and will like exacerbate the heart failure. Other than this, you will most probably almost always give intravenous fluid. In surgical patients, rapidly exclude hemorrhagic shock. Hemorrhage, either it's overt or hidden. Overt means that you are able to see some blood around the patient, coming out of the patient, or hidden, that th there is some, like, so there are some signs for hemorrhage or shock, but there is, there are, like, you cannot appreciate any uh, external hemorrhage, okay? This is a station in PLAP2, which is the uh, hysterectomy, post-hysterectomy station, the patient as hemorrhage, but the, uh, the hemorrhage is hidden, not overt. There is no vaginal bleeding. There is no bleeding from the surgical wound. However, the patient is uh, uh, seems to be in shock and it's a post-operative patient. So most probably this will be 
hemorrhagic shock until proved otherwise. Okay, let's start the actual steps. Start by an inspection. Inspect the color of hands and digits and lips. Peripheral cyanosis, central cyanosis. Then palpate the limb temperature, okay, for cold peripheries because it's a sign of shock. Measure the capillary refill time. Uh, peripheral capillary refill time in the fingers, on the fingers, and central capillary refill time by uh, pressing over the sternum. Okay, at, at set the state of veins, they might be collapsed in shock. Palpate peripheral and central pulses. By central pulse, I mean the carotid pulse, and by peripheral pulses, I mean the peripheral pulses in the upper limb and in the lower limb. Starting from uh, distal to proximal, and you should ideally assess right and left pulses. Okay, so peripheral pulsation means upper and lower uh, limbs pulse, right and left, starting from distal to proximal. So you will start for the upper limb, for example, uh, for with the radial pulse. If it's not found, look for the brachial. If it's not found, look for the axillary and so on. For the lower limb, start with the uh, dorsalis pedis, then the tibials, then the puputale. If you're going to find it, look for the femur. Okay, do that on the uh, left and right side. Comment on the pulse by saying for the central and peripheral pulse, by whether it's a present or not. And if it's present, you should comment on the rates, the quality of the pulse, regular or regular, and whether it's equal on both, both sides or not. Okay, for the rates, you can actually get it from the monitor. You don't have to calculate it by your hands. Just need to look to the monitor. In one station in CLAP2, there is a critical limb ischemia. So in this step, when you comment on the center and peripheral pulses, you should go for the upper and lower limb. So in lower limb, you will find no pulse in the dorsalis bedis, for example, on the right side. And then you check on the left side too and you will then look for the tibial artery. If not present, look for the pupitial. Okay, if it's present, it means that the obstruction is below the pupitial. If it's absent too, look for the femoral, and so on. Go from distal to proximal and right and left. Okay, for the capillary refill time, you have to press like for five seconds over the uh, finger or over the sternum. Wait, like press for five seconds and then release it and expect that the refill time should be like less than two seconds. If it's prolonged, it, it means the patient has sluggish circulation and it's, it, it means uh, the patient is in shock. Then measure the patient's blood pressure. In the exam, you will find it on the monitor and you will find the blood pressure cuff around the patient arm. Then auscultate the heart. You will find uh, stethoscope and auscultate the heart. Most probably for, uh, on the mannequin, you will find it somewhere in the middle over the sternum because it's not an actual heart, it's just a speaker showing you the heart sounds, same like I did with the breathing sounds. Then you need to comment on the heart whether, whether uh, it's uh, they are a normal or abnormal heart sounds. And if you say that I can appreciate a murmur according to your expertise, but at least say that this heart rate. These heart sounds are normal or abnormal. That's it. If you can uh, like appreciate that the patient has a urinary catheter, you should comment whether uh, there is oliguria or not, or if there is an attached fluid chart, you can say that if the urine volume is below uh, half milliliter per kg per hour, this means oliguria, which is one of the signs of shock. For the purpose of the examination, sometimes you might find a urinary catheter, but you might not be able to comment on this point. So you will just say that I will check for oligoria, I will verbalize it. You don't have to calculate it actually. So in circulation, you just stop by an inspection, inspection for the hands, digits, and lips for peripheral central cyanosis. Check limb temperature, capillary refer time, state of the veins, uh, peripheral uh, pulsation, upper and lower, right and left, distal to proximal, and then central pulsation and comment on these points. Then I look for the blood pressure, auscultate the heart. Ideally, I would check for the oliguria if, this, if there is a flow chart or uh, urinary catheter is attached. Then look for signs of external hemorrhage. 
in case you can find any. Okay, especially if the patient is in the post-operative uh, recovery room, if the patient has any wounds, if the patient has sustained any trauma, or if there is any drains. Okay, and you can also like uh, look for some evidence of concealed hemorrhage, which is the hidden hemorrhage. Like if there is uh, like a, a fluid pillar in the surgical wounds, or if there is a big bruise in the abdomen, and so on, or if there is like abdominal rigidity, these findings these finding can be found in real humans, but in the mannequin, uh, you will find nothing, but the examiner might tell you. Okay, so you just need to know the points and comment on them. Some points can be done. Some other points will just be said and mentioned. Okay. The specific treatment of the cardiovascular collapse also depends on the cause. But most probably, it will it should be directed toward fluid replacement. So you should say that I will give uh, 500 milliliters of Hartmann solution or uh, normal saline uh, directly into uh, the veins through a two white bore cannulas. You can give uh, 500 milliliters or can give one uh, liter as fast as you can, okay? You also need to control the hemorrhage. If there is a sign of like hemorrhage that is controllable, you need to stop it or say that ideally I should stop it. And you need to uh, aim for restoration of tissue perfusion by filling the circulation with fluids or blood and avoid exacerbation of shock. Although with exacerbation of shock, tissue perfusion will decrease, hypoxia will decrease, ischemia will decrease, uh, the hypoxia will increase, ischemia will increase, death might happen. Okay, so at the end of the circulation steps, a step most probably will say that ideally I will insert two white bore cannulas and um, uh, one or, or more, like one or two or more la large white bore cannulas, if you are asked exactly 14 or 16 gosh. And I will collect, collect some blood samples for routine hematological, biochemical, ablation tests and microbiological investigations and source matching before you infuse the intravenous fluid. Okay, take care of this point. You take the blood sample first, then you will do the fluid replacement. If the patient is apparently hypotensive, give a polus of 500 milliliter of four crystalloid solution, which is Hartman or sodium, sodium chloride. Most probably you'll find this in the uh, cubicle and you have to bring a bag, one of the bags on the table and uh, hang it uh, on the um, stand next to the patient. So you will find a stand and you'll find some uh, bags of fluids. So pick one of them and uh, put it or hang it over the stand and say that ideally I will run it uh, like rapidly within 15 minutes uh, or as, as fast as I can through the white bore cannulas. Okay, if you are suspecting that the patient might be in a cardiac failure, give him a smaller volume like 25 milliliters or uh, like um, keep like an eye on the patient and avoid giving them at all. So you can do either uh, of both. Anyway, you will have to reassess the patient and say and see the effects. Okay, if the patient does not improve, repeat the flow to change. Give him another polis and ask senior help. So if, if the examiner asks you, what will you do if the patient doesn't improve? I'll repeat the flow challenge and in, uh, involve a senior. Okay, and instead of just repeating the flow to change again and again, I will repeat it once and ask for more help. Uh, if you're sure of the cardiac failure signs, like the patient is dysnic, heart rate is very high, the jugular venous uh, pulse pressure is very high, and you can appreciate that third heart sound, and you can hear the pulmonary crackles on auscultation. So this is a complete picture of acute heart failure, and giving fluids will uh, ex like uh, make the patient die uh, sooner. Okay, so the treatments will kill the patient, actually the fluid will kill the patient. So you can either decrease the fluid infusion or stop it at all. And this is quite complex in the exam. You can just say that I will consider involving a senior and uh, give a smaller volume of fluids and run it uh, slowly or stop it if the patient is deteriorating. Okay, so in circulation, inspect palpate, blood pressure, oscultate, urinary catheter, look for external hemorrhage. Um, 
insert cannula, take plots, do fluid replacement. Okay, clear? Then now you reach it, the D, the disability. It's a collection of some uh, features of the critically ill patient, starting from the contrast level. Do it using the AVPU methods. You just say patient is alert, response to verbal or vocal stimuli, or response to painful stimuli, or it's unresponsive at all. Some other people would say that I can do the Galasco uh, coma scale as you like. If you can do it, do it. That's according to the uh, UK resuscitation uh, guidelines, you can preferably do the AVPO score because it's easier and faster. Okay, just say that my patient is alert or my patient is responsive to vocal stimuli or painful stimuli or unresponsive to painful or vocal stimuli, unresponsive at all. So first point, comment on that control slip. Then examine the pupil. Comment on the size equality on both sides and reaction to lights. Most probably there is no torch in the cubicle and the pupillary reaction is not, uh, is not one of the features of the cement, the mannequin. So you just verbalize it. I will ideally examine the pupils. Then, then you say that I would like to measure the blood glucose level to see whether it's high or low. One of the stations is low hypoglycemia and the treatments will be uh, IV glucose with the highest possible concentration with smaller amounts in the beginning. Then you maintain it uh, by giving 10% uh, glucose maintenance until the patient stabilizes. Okay. You will do this test user using finger prick bedside testing. Or if the patient is in shock, use a sample from the vein. Which vein? From the cannula you inserted here. You will take some blood from here. So add to these tests uh, one more for blood glucose. Okay, so in D, EVPO score, pupils, blood glucose. You can also check for exposure. Exposure includes everything else. Even some uh, like people say the A, B, C, D, E. The E stands for everything else. The UK see the like say that it stands for exposure. Anyway, even with exposure, you have to expose the patient to examine everything else. You examine the airway, you examine the breathing, you examine the circulation, and some other points in disability. Everything else will be included under uh, this category. So examine the patient properly, do the full exposure, and take a consent from the patient if it's if he the patient is conscious. Okay, and in each step, even when you expose the chest for the purpose of the chest examination, the breathing and the circulation, uh, ask the talk to the cement, uh, the mannequin, and say, I would like to examine your chest. May I uncover you? May I proceed? Yes, doctor, and so on. Okay, take, take permission before any step. But respect the patient dignity and minimize heat loss. Respect its dignity by uncovering only uh, the, the, the part you are examining. Don't just uncover uh, the, the patient completely. And minimize heat loss by just like uncover the patient, avoid uncovering the patient completely. And whenever you finish, cover the patient uh, quickly again. Okay, and verbalize this point. Okay, that's I need to uncover the patient. May I proceed? Yes, after finishing, I will cover the patient again to minimize heat loss, like written this point. When you uncover the patient, exam examine the abdomen, inspection, palpation, percussion, examine the pelvis, inspection, palpation, percussion, or do them together. In some trauma patients, you might check the pelvic fracture and then look for the lower limbs. You need to look for signs of trauma and like fractures or bruises or uh, hematoma. And if you didn't examine the pulses in the C, examine them now. Okay, all in all, check for trauma, look for wounds, abrasions, bruises, and fractures. In the exam, you just need to verbalize that. You say that I am looking for wounds, abrasions, bruises, fractures. And if you forgot to examine the pulse in C, say that's also distal pulses in the lower limb. 
same in the abdomen and bulbs. And if you find any of these, comment on them. Comment on surgical ones and dressings, if any. And in one station, which is the post-hysterectomy station, you will find the dressing. So you can comment on the wound if you can see it, or you can comment on the dressing if you can see it by saying that the wound is clean, the dressing is clean, the wound show uh, some uh, discharge or uh, bleed, blood is coming out of, uh, of its dressing is not clean, it shows pus, it shows bleeding blood, and so on. Okay. Now we have finished the A, B, C, D, E, but we said that we need to do something before and some other thing. So after we finish, we should, if the patient is stable, we can take full clinical history from the patient or from a patient relative or a friend or any other staff member if the patient was admitted and someone is aware of the condition of the patient. So after finishing, if the patient is stable, start doing this additional information. If the patient is not stable, repeat the approach. Okay, keep repeating the approach until the patient is stabilized. And say that, say that in the cubicle, that ideally it will reassist the patient, go through the ABCD approach again until the patient is stable. So if the patient has stabilized during your uh, eight minutes, start talking to the patient and take full clinical history from the patient as much as you can. This is not going to be for long, okay? Because the, the station is not about taking history. The station is about following the ABCD approach, okay? Because a man, is brought in the exam to test you for the clinically ill patient. So the approach will be ABCD approach. The approach will be the same, the steps will be the same, but the findings will vary. After taking some clinical history, review the patient notes and charts, okay? And review the results of any laboratory and radiological investigations. Uh, consider whether the patient should be like stay in the ward or uh, transmitted to a high dependence unit or an intensive care unit make complete entries in the patient log, document what happened, document the assessments and the finding and the treatments you have given to the patient, okay? And if you are like uh, uh, leaving the shift, hand it over to your colleague in a proper way and record the response to therapy, as I said, and consider definitive treatments of the underlying condition, not just treating the symptomatic way, the symptomatic, uh, treating in a symptomatic way because as I told you, the main aim of the ABCD approach is to keep the patient alive. As long as the patient is alive, then we will buy some time for further treatments and uh, reaching a diagnosis so that we can reach the underlying co cause of the problem and treat it. So all of these points will just need to be verbalized in the station because you will not actually do most of them. You can barely take some history. Okay, like in uh, one station, you can just, the patient is stable, talk to the patient and say, how are you feeling now? What happened? Tell me what happened to you. Why did it happen to you? How is your health? How has it been recently? And so on. Okay, so these points can be asked. Uh, you can ask it about these points from the examiner, like what will you do, doctor, after all of that? You just need to be ready with some points from these to uh, know that, it's like to let the examiner know that you are aware of the process. Okay. So uh, now I have finished. I will unmute you so that you can ask any question if you need. 